here tonight. Hallelujah. God bless these children. You folks come over here and join us if you'd like. In the center, got lots of room. John chapter 1. I'm preaching tonight on the Lamb of God. John chapter 1 and verse 29. Somebody say praise the Lord. He is worthy, isn't he, to be exalted. The next day, John the Baptist seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. For, and John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bare record that this is the Son of God. Again, the next day after John, I stood and two of his disciples are looking upon Jesus as he walked. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following him and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and see where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, and thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. I pray that you would open our eyes, the eyes of our heart, that we might receive revelation and understand, Lord, this beautiful truth that you have uh, made known in your word to us. Grant us, O oh God, your anointing, Lord, to see in the spirit tonight. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody say amen. 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 It's really interesting how the Old Testament, they practiced the law out of obedience to the Lord. And they brought those little lambs Every year they would offer a lamb 
for the Passover. And that was what we would celebrate as, as Easter, uh, a Good Friday uh, today. And then following that was the Feast of First Fruits, which took place exactly three days later uh, on the Sunday morning. And they went through the routine uh, year after year. And there were also other lambs that were offered as sacrifices throughout the year. Uh, so there was constantly sacrificing going on. And they did it out of faithfulness to the Lord, but without a great understanding of what it really meant, the full significance. Now, we know that the first time that um, uh, they offered a sacrifice as a nation was during the time that God led his people Israel out of Egypt. They were under, under terrible bondage of the enemy, a bondage that came as a result of them being slaves to the Egyptians. And God absolutely wrecked an empire to deliver his people and bring them out from underneath the hand of that terrible bondage. And he did so through the offering of a lamb. You know, the judgment came upon all the land and, and God ma makes no uh, respect, shows no respect to persons. The scripture tells us very clearly that all of sin comes short of the glory of God. And that night that the death angel passed over Egypt, you know something? The Israelites were not any more exempt from that than what the Egyptians were, were it not for the blood of the lamb. See, each household took a lamb, a precious, innocent, sweet little lamb, and, um, and they, caused, uh, they, they killed that lamb, allowed the blood to, to spill out, caught it in a basin, offered that uh, upon the doorposts and the lintels of their house, and then they roasted that lamb in the fire, and they had to eat every bit of that lamb. And uh, if it was too much for that particular family, then they were to share it with their neighbor. But it was to be eaten, none of it was to be left, none of it was to be wasted, and not one bone of his body was to be broken. Well, they understood the significance of being released from slavery, from the terrible oppression of the Egyptians, but they obviously did not fully understand the slavery of sin. That's the far more worse slavery, the slavery of sin. To be bound by the power of darkness and not to be able to help yourself. I'll tell you something. The only thing that can deliver us from that is the power of the blood of Jesus. Amen? It's the blood of Jesus that changes us. Uh, but for many, many years, decades, and centuries, they offered this sacrifice not fully understanding that God was going to come in flesh as the Messiah. And he would be the Lamb of God. The Lamb of all lambs. The Lamb of God. And I suppose that even to John the Baptist, who was a second cousin of Jesus, and no doubt there was some connection because of their families, I'm sure that there was some connection there and that he realized who Jesus was. I'm, I know that um, there's, there's a whole lot of history that the Bible blanks out on. It doesn't give us a lot of the details, but we know that his, John's parents were very elderly when they had him. And no doubt before John grew to be a, a mature man of 30 and began his ministry, both um, Elizabeth and Zacharias probably had passed on. And it is possible, highly possible, that John was brought up in the wilderness. The scripture talks about that being in the wilderness. Uh, no doubt by the Essenes, who were a group of Jews that were really odd. They were the oddballs of society because they didn't mix like the Pharisees and Sadducees. Uh, they lived way off in seclusion. And uh, no doubt he was brought up by them. He may have been, might have been because his parents died and somebody had to take him in. And, you know, there was not a lot of relatives because, well, there was no other siblings that John had. He was the only child. And so it is highly possible, though the scriptures don't tell us this and history does. I'm surmising somebody took him in and no doubt it was the Essenes because John really, really stood out from everybody else. He was a very unique individual, the way he dressed. He did not dress in the finery of the day. He did not look, he did not act like a priest. He did not grow up in a priest's home, and maybe for a little bit of time, but then obviously uh, whisked away to the wilderness. And the scriptures tell us that he grew up, he wore camel's hair, which I think would be a very itchy garment, if you could ask me. <laughs> and, and he looked different. The Bible says he ate locusts and wild honey. And so he certainly was not part of the religious establishment like his father uh, was. And uh, so this day when uh, John is out baptizing people and Jesus comes to him and he says, you need to baptize me. And, and John has spiritual perception. He is a prophet. He said, no, no. He said, I need to be baptized by you. 
And Jesus said, please, just go along with it. Let us fulfill all righteousness. You see, for Jesus to step into that role as the priest, he had to be washed and he had to be anointed. The scripture tells us that the Old Testament, the high priest had to, be, had to wash in the labor, had to wash from head to foot, had to put on special garments. And then uh, he had to be anointed with the holy anointing oil. That was not something that the average person could have on their flesh. Only those that were in the priesthood. And so when uh, Jesus comes to John and John submits to him and baptizes him, the Bible says when he come up out of the water that the Spirit of God came down upon him like a dove. That's the anointing. So Jesus was washed and anointed. And the scripture says he was about 30 years of age when this happened. Now that's an interesting number because in Bible days, we became a man at age 12. You were a young man. You were obviously an adolescent, but you were considered a man. You started to be trained by your dad in whatever trade or occupation that he uh, worked in. You were be trained and then you were not considered a mature man until 30. I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of truth to that. And in the Bible uh, days, uh, to be a priest, you, had, you could start out as a Levite at 25, but you couldn't actually step into the priestly role until you were 30. So the Bible says Jesus, being about 30 years of age, came to John to be baptized. And as we see, he was washed and he was anointed to begin his ministry. Now, the interesting thing is we know him as a high priest. The scripture tells us in Hebrews, Jesus is a high priest. But here in this chapter, chapter one of John, we see uh, John, uh, the revelator, um, um, communicating to us that Jesus is also the lamb. How could he be the high priest that offers the lamb and the lamb at the same time? Well, that's quite simple. Amen. Jesus can be both the high priest and he can be the lamb. He can be the father. He can be the son. Amen. The Bible says unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. Of the increase of his kingdom there shall be no end. His name shall be called the mighty God. The everlasting father. The prince of peace. He can be the father, the son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Christ in you. Well, the physical Christ is not in you. The spiritual Christ is in you. How? By the power of the Holy Ghost. That's Jesus in your heart, in your life. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I'll tell you, he can be the high priest and he can be the lamb. It's really interesting. You see, um, when God spoke to Mary and told her that she was going to conceive supernaturally and bring forth the Messiah or the Savior to this world, she said, how is this possible? I, I've, I'm I'm only engaged. I've never, I've never been involved with my husband, my husband to be. And uh, the God says through the angel, the Holy Ghost will come upon you, and that which will be conceived in you will be a, the Son of God. Amen. That's what the Scripture says. Well, that happened in Nazareth, but as providence would have it, uh, you know, God can work through circumstances, even circumstances we don't like. God even, can even work through the government, even when we don't like what they do sometimes. Amen. The government decided that it's time to have a great taxing. Of course, the taxing was probably a yearly thing, but they also did a census, and everybody was required to go back to their homeland where they where they came from. Well, Joseph, being of the of the uh, lineage of David, and uh, his family originally coming from the Bethlehem area, he has to take Mary, who is now, as the Scripture says, great with child. We say, what does that mean? That means she was she was really showing. <laughs> She was showing. She was she was great with child. Yes, she was. She was ready to be delivered. She was like, just don't. Uh, uh, you know what it's like when you're ready to be delivered. You just want to be delivered, and that's it. Amen. And they make this long trip of several several miles. I believe it was about uh, ninety miles, if I'm not mistaken, from Nazareth to Bethlehem, all the way. And we know it was a very uncomfortable. A journey for her and for both of them, his concern for her and her just her comfort and her concerns about, am I going to make it? And also thinking, oh, it would be so much better if I could be with mama back in Nazareth. But you know, God had it all planned out. You see, Bethlehem was where the prophet Micah prophesied that Jesus would be born. The Messiah would be born. Thou Bethlehem, Judah, though thou be little amongst the thousands of, of, uh, of Israel, yet out of thee shall arise him that shall be governor over my people. So the Messiah was to come from Bethlehem, and all the priesthood knew that. And then here is Joseph and Mary, and they're knocking on the doors, trying to find an inn or a motel or a hotel or, or just somebody that will have pity. And then finally somebody looks at them and says, you know what? You need help. Here's a stable. You can stay in the cave overnight. And that's all it was, just probably a hole in the side of the mountain with some kind of a gate over the front. And that's where the animals 
were uh, all, um, but no better place for the Lamb of God to be born than in a stable. Amen? Doesn't that make sense? The interesting thing about Bethlehem is that Bethlehem means uh, house of bread. Bethlehem, house of bread. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. Hallelujah. Here he is the bread of life being born in the house of bread. How fitting is that? Another thing that makes Bethlehem really unique is that it was probably only about 15 miles or so. Or, uh, I may be mistaken. It's not very far at all from Jerusalem. And uh, the sacrificial lambs that were used in the temple every year were raised. They were born and raised in Bethlehem. Amen. So interesting, isn't it? Here he is, the bread of life, being born in the house of bread. And now he is the sacrificial lamb, and he is going to be born in a stable. How fitting for the lamb of God, amongst the other lambs and animals. Amen? Beautiful, isn't it, the Christmas story? I don't think Mary and Joseph understood fully what was being fulfilled. But the scripture tells us that after he was born, that uh, Mary took the babe and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Now, I just saw this week on Facebook that apparently the mangers that were used uh, for the lambs uh, as a feeding trough or whatever were made of stone. We often think of a, of a wooden type of a, but it was a stone and they show a picture on that. Uh, stone and obviously they would have laid some hay in there and made it comfortable and then placed him in there the place where the little lambs would be would be placed after they were born and they were also wrapped up wrapped up tightly and laid in those mangers can you say praise the lord amen now in the middle of the night when this after this had taken place God sends his angels to serenade a group of lonely shepherds out on the hillside and the bible says the angel of the lord came upon them you can imagine the glory of his presence as he's standing there, and, 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 and they're shocked. The first thing the angel says is, fear not, because they're terrified to see a heavenly creature appear before them. And the Bible says, the angel said, fear not, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And the Bible says, suddenly there was with the angel uh, all the heavenly hosts singing and praising God, singing glory to God in the highest and on peace and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. You've heard the Christmas story before. And the shepherds, their hearts were touched and they thought, oh, this is so exciting. Let us go even now to Bethlehem. Obviously, they're just on the outskirts in the field. Let's go to Bethlehem and let's see this thing which the Lord has come to pass. Well, you know, these very shepherds were no doubt the shepherds that were tending the sheep that were being raised to be the sacrificial lambs in Jerusalem. Isn't that amazing how God calls them? And they are the only ones that night that are permitted to know of this story uh, and to be able to visit Mary and Joseph, according to the scriptures. They come in and they bow down and they worship and they share with Mary and Joseph a tremendous confirmation that they're in the will of God. I think probably they needed it right now. I'm sure that Joseph's heart was embarrassed that he couldn't provide something better for Mary. And, um, and Mary, no doubt, was so concerned about the cold and the, and the other things in the environment there. It might not be the safest, most sterile environment to be uh, have put in a, a baby into. But God takes care of all things, doesn't he? When things are less than perfect, God is always there. In fact, I find many times God shows up when things are less than perfect. Amen? He works through the imperfect things of life to perfect us and to get us into his plan. But they began to worship the little baby Jesus. And then the scripture says that they went throughout Bethlehem declaring unto everybody the wonderful things that happened. The Lamb of God. Praise the Lord. Now in Acts chapter 8, we find a man by the name, well, he doesn't have a name here. He's just known as a eunuch. And the scripture says, in chapter 8 of Acts and verse 27, uh, that Philip arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Now, this is quite a powerful statement. I heard a message on this, and I won't try to do it justice like, like uh, Brother Adam Shaw did, but it was a tremendous message of brokenness. You see, those that were captured from other lands and taken in as slaves for the conquerors uh, were castrated. It was a very, very cruel and uh, barbaric process. 
and it was humiliating, it was uh, demasculating, demasculizing, and also many, many of the men who are as, as boys or teenagers or whatever that endured this did not survive the process. It was very, very sad. So, um, and, and to top it all off, they were, they were put into uh, positions where they uh, served under uh, particularly queens because they could be trusted around the queen. And also they were put in positions uh, sometimes of great authority and could become uh, very wealthy with their different positions working for great people uh, in royalty, etc., etc. This particular uh, man was a man who had experienced much rejection. He was, he was the boy that uh, his voice never changed. He was the boy that um, was marked as a eunuch. Um, many people believe that uh, that they were they were under a curse, that they were they were to be rejected. Uh, this was a this man was a picture of brokenness, and yet uh, the scripture says he came to Jerusalem for to worship the Lord. Now the scripture tells us very plainly that if somebody was in such a, a shape as, as this man was, they were not allowed to go into the temple. All he could do would be just to stand on the outside and talk to people about what did you experience, what did you what did you feel, what did you see. He might be able to hear the music, he might be able to pick up, but he went to Jerusalem to worship because there was a hunger in his heart to know God and to serve the Lord. Amen. And God saw this man. God saw this man. He had all the wealth. He had he had prestige, but he had an empty soul. Here he is returning from uh, Jerusalem. He went there to worship, was not able to participate with the rest of the uh, population. And he's heading back home uh, and he's reading his Bible. Now we know he had to be quite wealthy because he was reading from the scroll of Isaiah. It's a big book, 66 chapters. And to have a, a Bible or even a book of the Bible in those days was something that was uh, very, very rare. So he obviously had finances. And he was returning the Bible, says, and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him. Oh, wish we'd run when the Lord spoke to us. Amen. He ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. And he said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I? Except some, some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, or I ask thee, of whom speaks the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Who is the prophet? Who is this poor soul that is described like a lamb? He was led as a sheep to the slaughter like a lamb down before shear. Is Isaiah speaking about himself? Or is he speaking of some other man? And then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And no doubt, having been in the 53rd chapter, he would have read these verses together with the eunuch. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And so as he explains to the poor eunuch the message about Jesus, how that Jesus in his brokenness has brought us redemption. Jesus in his brokenness has brought us healing of our body. Jesus in his brokenness has brought us healing of, uh, for our minds and emotions by his, um, the chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. Amen? So the healing for the body, for the soul, and for the spirit. And the, and the eunuch says, I want this. And so he, they came to certain water. Obviously, it was probably an oasis in the middle of the desert. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered, he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe he could also have said, I believe that Jesus Christ is is the Lamb of God. And in his brokenness, he came to save me and he healed me in my brokenness. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way 
rejoicing. But Philip was found as his oldest, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Amen. Now, it's interesting when you just do a little bit of research into the scriptures about the Lamb of God. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Peter 18, 1 18 and 19, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. How many know that it doesn't matter how much money you have, you could not pay enough for salvation? It's priceless. It's beyond. All the, all the money in the world could not purchase your soul. We're not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold. But, verse 19, with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now the Bible tells us that before they would sacrifice that lamb, they had to examine that lamb for a certain period of time. And he would be checked out by the high priest to make sure there was no marks, no cuts, no scrapes, no deformities, no lameness in that lamb. That lamb had to be a perfect lamb. And the scripture tells us that before Jesus Christ went to the cross, he stood before Pilate. And Pilate thoroughly examined him with many questions and checked him out. And when he brought him back before the high priests and all of the elders of Israel, he said, I have examined him this day. And I tell you, I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. And then he delivered him off to be crucified because of the pressure of the religious rulers. The scripture says... He was the lamb slain. Jesus said, no man takes my life from me, but I lay it down. Look at verse 20. It's interesting. There's a quite a, a, a phrase right here in verse 20. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Before, before the world was ever created in the mind and the plan of God, uh, this was had already taken place in the mind of God. It was as good as done. It was foreordained that God would come in flesh and would die upon the cross. That was foreordained long before the world. But look at the next few verse, uh, next few words in the verse. But it was manifest in these last times for you. Now, how many of you can honestly say you did not realize that the last days began with Jesus' death? We've actually been in the last days since Jesus died. He was manifest in these last times for you. We are in the latter days of the last times. But the, but the last days actually started with the church age and with Jesus Christ, uh, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He was manifest in these last times for us. Interesting, isn't it, when we get into the scripture? I love Revelation because the Bible tells us that um, the lamb was slain for us and uh, it tells us a picture of these conquering lamb of God. Amen. Now, in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1, we see John standing before the throne. And in the right hand of him that sat on the throne was a book written uh, on the, uh, within and on the backside. So within the book and on the backside cover it was also written, and it was sealed with seven seals. Now, in those days, a scroll um, was, as we said before, was a very costly thing, and many times they would write on the front and the back, but uh, this was all rolled up. So when it says a book, we picture a book like, like um, you know, our Bibles or like a novel that opens up, but that's not how their Bibles were. They were a scroll that you just kept unrolling and unrolling, and if there were contents that were not able to be revealed, they would seal the scroll. So a letter that had to go to government, if it was confidential or what we would say uh, top secret, then it would be sealed with wax and that wax would have the seal of the governor or the king or whoever it was that had sealed it would, would press their ring into that and so you would know that you were not allowed to open that up. The only person that could open that would be the person that was in a position of authority. So we see this scroll and it's sitting in the hand of, of God upon the throne and it's got seven seals. I, I like to picture red wax seals on it. I didn't know what color they were. And, uh, and uh, he said, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals? Who is worthy? We want to know what's in this book. Now, this book was a revelation of what's going to happen in the world today. We're living in that day when these seals actually uh, are going to be fulfilled. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, 
uh, who is worthy. And no man in heaven and earth, verse 3, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals there. We've got a king here, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ, who's the root of David. Um, he's prevailed to open up the book and to loose the seals thereof. He's got the authority. He is the lion. Just like the lion is the king of the jungle, Jesus Christ is manifested here as a lion. He says, don't weep. He said, we're going to be able to understand what the message is from God. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. He turned around to see this lion of the tribe of Judah. And what did he behold? But a lamb. A soft, white, woolly, innocent, sweet-looking little lamb. A lamb as it had been slain. A lamb with blood on its, on its coat. And this lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits, sent forth into all the earth. Now that's a mystery in itself. A mystery opening up a mystery. Amen. There's a mystery of the seven seals. What's written in that scroll? We are so curious. We are so hungry spiritually to understand what is in the word of God. And now another mystery comes along. This lion who does not look anything like a lion, but yet he is powerful. Uh, the seven horns, horns always in scripture speak of power. Seven horns of perfect power. Uh, uh, seven eyes, which speaks of perfect vision, able to see everything clearly. This Jesus Christ, the lion who comes as the lamb, is able to, uh, to open up the book and cause us to understand it. You know something? When we understand Jesus Christ, when we understand who he is and what he has come to do, then the word of God makes sense to us. Amen? The Bible is, is like a sealed book until we see it uh, through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ reveals to us the truths of the Word of God. And uh, until we see Jesus, we don't really understand anything in the Old Testament at all. It's just like a sealed book. And that lamb came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. So these 24 elders. Now, it is believed that uh, 24, 12 representing the 12 tribes of, the, of Israel, the Old Testament, and 12 representing the New Testament disciples of Jesus. So the Old Testament and the New Testament. These beasts were symbolic of all the believers from the Old and the New Testament. And the scripture says, they fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, as they fell down, no doubt those golden vials were emptied out, and those odors were spilled all over. That was the prayers of the saints. And the scripture tells us that our prayers never die, that they go, they go up before the Lord. They ascend to heaven, and God holds on to our prayers. Amen? Yes, he does. They sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals there, for thou was slain and has revealed to us, has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. You have saved people, O Lamb of God, from every kindred, every family, every language group, every people, every nation. Aren't you thankful that we are part of a universal church? Hallelujah. Uh, because of the blood of the Lamb. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So Jesus Christ is revealed in the book of Revelation. We often think of Revelation as a book of prophecy, but really it's a book that contains prophecy, but it's primarily a book to reveal to us that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. That he's the conquering Savior, and that we're on his side, and that we're on the winning side. Amen? God has made us unto our God uh, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Hallelujah. We are living in this day when the Lamb of God is revealing uh, the truths of end time prophecy. 
Many things we have looked at in prophecy and we said, oh, I, I understand a little bit about it, but there's so many unanswered questions. How many know that as we proceed into the future, we're going to understand more and more and more? Why? Because the Lamb of God has taken off those seals and revealed to us what's going to happen. You know, the world is lying in darkness. They are, they are lying in darkness. They are in, uh, in a place of ignorance, not understanding what's going on. Uh, all of these things that have been happening in the world today, uh, they've been earth-shaking events. Amen. And just not the world in general, even in our own lives, there have been some world-shaking events that have been taking place. And the scripture tells us everything that can be shaken will be shaken except the kingdom of God. That's the only thing that will remain safe and secure. Amen. The church of the living God and those that are in it, the kingdom of God uh, shall not be shaken. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And as we look to the Lamb of God, we are going to understand more and more of what's going to happen. Now, the world, as, as, as a rule, has rejected uh, God. And that's really the reason why it's in such a mess economically, environmentally, uh, spiritually, financially, every way that you look. My goodness, our health care system is just a mess. It's a mess. We just need to pray. We really need to pray for the doctors and nurses that serve in our hospitals. It's, they're overworked. They are, uh, it, it's, it's really, really in critical uh, shape right now. And our, our governments, uh, the money that's been spent, extra cash that we really didn't have, and then out of the provincial pot, out of the federal pot, how many know that there's a lot, there's been a lot of money spent on this, on this COVID? Amen. I think, I think it could bring us to a place of bankruptcy. Inflation is just soaring. It's crazy. The price of gas. Almost need to take a second mortgage out in your house to fill your tank. It's crazy, isn't it? The cost of food, you've got to watch those sale flyers. How many of you already do that? We always do, but we're really doing it now. Watch those sale flyers and don't be loyal to any store. Go to where the best bargains are. I'm telling you, the world is shaking. And the scripture reveals that. Uh, the Lamb of God has revealed that in the book of Revelation, that everything will be shaken. It talks about that. It talks about the cost of wheat. It talks about um, it talks about the threat of war. It talks about um, it talks about diseases and that type of thing, and pollution and environmental things. All these things we don't need to be afraid. I'll tell you why. Because the Lamb of God is in control. Amen. Yes, He is. Now it's interesting to note that when Jesus comes back, that it's, it's going to be for us that are ready to meet him, it's going to be, it's going to be a happy day. Amen? Amen? We're going to be changed. We're going to be like him. We're going to be in his presence forever and ever. Uh, in chapter tw or 6 and verse 12, the Bible says, I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree casted her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. He said, it just seemed like a fig tree was shaken and all the figs were falling. That's what was happening. All the meteors in heaven falling and just comets and all kinds of things uh, that were uh, lighting up the sky. And the heaven departed as a scroll. We just scroll together and every mountain, every island was moved out of place. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men, all the who's who's, and every bondman, that's all, every slave, and every free man, they hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And you know what they were saying? They were saying to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. Now the Lamb of God came into this world to take the wrath of God. To take the wrath of God, to take our punishment, to pay the price for our sin to take our guilt, to take our shame, to take our hell for us on the cross. That's why he hung on the cross. He died there so that we could be saved from all of that. But you know something? If we don't receive God's grace and receive the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us, then we will face not the mercy of the Lamb, but the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day, verse 17, of his wrath is come. And who? shall be able to stand. I was quite surprised as I went through Revelation just to see how many different places 
mentions the Lamb of God over and over. It's mentioned in chapter 7, verse 9. He said, After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, kindreds, people, and languages, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And the palms were a symbol of victory. Amen. And the white robes were a symbol of righteousness. And they're standing before the Lamb of God in heaven. And they cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God, which stood upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Amen. And the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts fell down upon before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered and said unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And where do they come from? Who are all these millions and millions of believers? He did not recognize them. And John didn't recognize them either. He said, Sir, he said, Thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Let me ask you something. How do you think that all these people could get saved during the time of great tribulation if we were not here in order to help them to get saved? Amen? Hallelujah. I believe that we are going to be here. I believe that we're going to be here um, for a portion of that seven-year period, and I believe that we are going to be pointing people to the Lamb of God. Amen? And I believe that we were going to see many, many people uh, come and bow their knees to the Lord. Hallelujah. I believe that God's already God's already working in families and in homes connected to our church. God is getting us ready for the great day of the Lord. Amen? And it will be a great day when I look upon his face. Hallelujah. The one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. Oh, what a day. Glorious day. That will be when I stand before the Lord and I see those nail scars in his hands and in his feet. I see the, the evidence of the wounds that he received for my sin and for yours to pay the price for our salvation. Oh, my heart will burst with love for him. Hallelujah. It won't be the gold streets and the walls of Jasper and the gates of Pearl. That will be the most beautiful thing. But it'll be looking upon the face of the Lamb of God as we stand before him. Amen. I wonder if we could stand together and I'd like us to sing that song. What a day that will be. Hallelujah. When we stand before the wonderful Lamb of God and we are in his presence for all eternity. Hallelujah. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see when I look upon his face the one who saved me by
love you, Jesus. Oh, 